Hi, I'm Vanyu, this is Vlad, and we will present what is going on uh, around one project in quantum technology at Wells Fargo. Let me see if the stick works, yes. So it is about prediction of time series of interest for financial industry. It can be information coming from anything uh, in the company. It could be market movement, it could be volatility of the market prices, it could be decision, a stream of decisions made during some security lending auction. It can be anything that evolves in time and most importantly it is stochastic. It means that it happens with particular probability. In the same circumstances, circumstances, the same thing can happen in different ways during the day with different probability. This is the first characteristic of the events we are trying to model. The second characteristic is it is the, the high dimensionality of the process. It depends on many factors, many features. It is difficult to estimate which feature is prevalent uh, impact, simply because the impact of the features usually is non-stationary. During the day, one feature can have, during different time of the day, one feature can be more important than the other. Then it's hierarchical. Just simple example, the price depends on the volatility, the volatility depends on the derivative of the volatility, etc. So it is another level of complexity. Um, Again, correlations and causations. A lot of people things are correlated at these markets. Uh, and of course, if we investigate the entire correlation graph, this will be combinatorially uh, intractable. And also, something is causally related, which is different than correlated. And uh, the, to make uh, the picture full, uh, all these uh, processes are not fully observable. We can observe only some of their features. They are partially observable. This is why uh, we decided that uh, maybe one promising way to gain some success is to use generative models. Uh, the generative models are the base on which later a lot of other artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies built. So the think of the, pro, the, the goal of the generative model is to build joint distributions of things of interest. Good thing for our use case is that the generative models can build joint distributions of observable and latent variables simultaneously. So somehow we can account for the things we don't know about directly. Uh, the other uh, reason, uh, especially to choose to build quantum generative models is the possibility to model the correlations. Uh, as I said, usually the correlation graph is not tractable, but if we model the correlation graph through the entanglement structure of a quantum system, this uh, correlation structure becomes instantly, uh, instantly computable through the entanglement structure. The third reason is the low dim lower dimensionality of the quantum generative uh, models. Uh, we have a uh, theoretical work uh, published uh, where we prove that for some classes of generative models, uh, the quantum models are quadratically simpler than the corresponding classical models. Uh, example, uh, if particular uh, um, process can be modeled for in not less than 100 dimensions, 100 dimensional vector in the classical case, we can model the process only using 10 dimensional Hilbert space. And of course, uh, uh, square root of 10, uh, three, uh, four qubits, let's say. Uh, this is pretty, pretty simple model. And the last one, these models are easy to learn. In another theoretical work we have published, we have proven that the learning structure of the quantum generative models is smooth, which makes the learning process uh, good, feasible. Of course, it is multi-model process. Uh, we need to find some 
satisfaction, uh, satisfiable extrema. Uh, okay, let's go this way. Now, the formalism our work is built on is the formalism of uh, quantum uh, uh, stochastic operations. Uh, a stochastic quantum operation is uh, the formal model of everything uh, uh, which can happen in the quantum world, from a unitary evolution, uh, projective measurement, through adding, adding qubits, tracing out qubits, doing non-projective measurement, POVM measurement, everything can be modeled by a stochastic quantum operation. In general, the stochastic quantum operation is a matrix, a linear operator. Uh, usually, in order to accomplish our goal, we represent this operator as sum of several complete positive trace-preserving operators, another level of operators. For every event we observe in the world, we assign one of these CPTP operators. In such a way, we built a complete stochastic quantum operation, and we can model or calculate the state of the quantum system during its evolution. All the states here we demonstrate and we are using, uh, these are mixed states. Uh, they are uh, 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 combinations, uh, probabilistic combinations with, of uh, pure states, simply because our systems can be in many states at the same time, and many classically states at the same time, simply because we don't have enough information to define the real state of the system. So all the time when I talk about the state of the system, I will mean the mixed state of the system, which is usually represented by the density matrix of the system. In order to execute this on real quantum hardware, we have to transit from stochastic quantum operations, we have to transit to uh, circuit, circuit model, circuit computing model for quantum computation. Uh, there is a fundamental theorem uh, of quantum information theory, which tells us how to do this extending the classical system, the, sorry, extending the quantum system with additional qubits, additional subsystem, where the base system will be measured. This is the picture how this type of systems operate. The, we have one unitary operator which defines the evolution of the system, the dynamics of the system. This unitary operator is applied on a main system on the top and a ancillary system or uh, emission system on the bottom. Usually the operator causes transition of the state of the main system and simultaneously it entangles the main system with the uh, emission system. After every step of this uh, bipartite system, we measure the emission system and we get information about the state uh, or this is the observable. For example, in the financial world, for it, we see the price. We see the price, but the price is just a little piece of everything which happens in the main state on the top. After we measure the price or we measure the uh, emission system, we reset the emission system. The reset of the emission system is done for the purpose to make the entire process Markovian. It means every next state depends only on the previous state. So this is why we have to recover the state of the measurement system at the point of uh, when the, the evolution began. Uh, again, this is simplification in order to simplify the model after I will discuss more complicated models than this. But this is the base building block. We have evolution and we have measurement of part of the system. As you know, this measurement is noisy. It is a probabilistic process uh, with particular probability. We can measure one or any other uh, observable connected to the system. But this is exactly, this model is exactly what we want to do. The only uh, simplification here is the assumption that the system is Markovian. Now, building on this basic idea about latent state, observable states, entanglement of between the latent state and the observable states, we design, we provide, we investigated several patterns. The first pattern is, as I already mentioned, this is the Markovian process. The second pattern, you can see the 
reset after the measurement is based on some calculation which can include the outcome of the measurement. So we have additional uh, uh, classical calculation followed by uh, classically conditioned gate that changes the system for the next step. This is the pattern to model non Markovian systems. Uh, next uh, uh, variation of the basic pattern, uh, we can implement reinforcement learnings, re uh, reinforcement learning scenarios using this. Just imagine after every measurement, we in interpret the measurement as action the agent should apply to the environment. We apply the action to the environment, we see the response of the environment, and we calculate what should be the next substate of the system. This is the next picture. And uh, the same idea can be um, applied to what is called quantum tran transducers with attention eventually. These are the systems which uh, are fed with particular uh, stream of symbols and they generate another stream of, of symbols. The idea of the attention is that we can condition the generation on the importance of the input stream. But these are the basic uh, patterns of uh, quantum calculation we have employed in our research. We have employed this mostly for market price, especially modeling of a statistic called uh, uh, mid price. Uh, the mid price is statistic of a financial vehicle called limit order book, and the mid price is the average between the best task and the best bit for particular security. This is extremely quickly changing uh, process, the statistic. It changes uh, at nanosecond base. Uh, usually, we model this at second base using particular technology to integrate uh, the measurement, and uh, we model uh, daily, we have around 14,000 measurements. So we measure 14,000 uh, moments a day. Also, we have applied this technology to model the market volatility. Again, you can see pretty simple, for simple cases, of course, but pretty simple circuits to model these processes. And the next step is how to apply everything to build some particular, uh, some particular machine learning system. One of the ways is to use the technology we just developed as generative models to build quantum kernels or kernels based on the generative models. The kernels, the goal of kernels is to measure the distance between two sequences. In this case, we measure the distance between two sequences through the distance between the states they have generated. And uh, uh, we have proven, we have theoretical proof, we have experimental results showing that with the increase of the distance between the states, the distance between the future distance, the future of the process gets away. This is exactly what we want to have. We want to have close states, similar future, uh, further apart states, uh, very di the different future in order to predict properly what kind of experiments we have done here, what we'll explain. Okay, thank you, Vanya. Mm -hmm. Um, so Vanya talked about the structure of the problem. Uh, so now what we need to do is to calculate the um, kernel element between two states. Um, unfortunately, as, as you see from the picture, because it's not a unitary approach, we cannot use the typical uh, fidelity kernel, as uh, was probably mentioned even in the morning sessions. So we had to come up with a different strategy. The first one we tried was to create a swap test circuit uh, using the generators um, when you showed and something we discussed in our first paper. So in this circuit we uh, combine two generators on, on one um, circuit and then we use um, the swap test um, uh, qubit. So altogether that comes down to a number of uh, observations we need to make uh, twice the um, length of the time series um, or sequence and um, one qubit for uh, the swap test. So unfortunately that uh, doesn't scale well with the number of shots. So if we have only thousand shots, you see the picture is very blurry. Uh, but as you increase the number of shots, uh, uh, it becomes more and more clear. Um, however, uh, the thumb estimate um, of um, how many shots we need uh, for this particular approach will 
probably allow us to um, simulate uh, sequences up to length 10, but uh, at this point we'll need about uh, 10 million shots. So what is the better approach? Uh, the better approach is to use uh, projective, projective kernels. So this is uh, inspired by the work of Huang and others uh, described in the well-known paper, Power of uh, Data in uh, Quantum Machine Learning. Um, so and the idea here is simple. So we can, um, in our case, because we have one qubit representing the, the state, um, exactly express the density matrix uh, as components of uh, poly matrices, and which means that we can actually measure um, uh, the density matrix by doing measurements in three bases. Um, and so this approach actually scales much better uh, in terms of the shot no uh, in terms of number of shots needed and with 10 million shots we can simulate sequences up to length 19 which is pretty high. So the circuit here would look like this. So this circuit combines um, actually three generators um, measured in different bases. So we we'll kind of use um, multi-modeling approach, um, so on, on the same circuit. And even for 1,000 shots, uh, simulator gives us very clear picture. Now, of course, it would be not um, as interesting if we were just uh, running it on, on, on the simulator, so we wanted to map it onto a quantum device. Uh, and again, um, we wanted to take advantage uh, of the fact that nowadays uh, IBM quantum processors uh, have um, 127 qubits, for example, uh, using Eagle. So what we did is we mapped uh, not only the measurements, but also doing uh, those multiple iterations in parallel onto a single uh, processor chip. So you see the um, initial layout map. So we effectively use 72 qubits um, to run uh, 12 of, of those generators in parallel. So remember, we need three measurements, so three um, uh, by 12 and by 2 gives us 72 qubits that we effectively use um, in a, every single shot. And with this um, approach, uh, the result we got for the um, kernel element matrix is, is very um, contrast. Uh, and so we can distinguish different sequences. So what uh, this um, graph is showing, uh, we looked at the sequences up to um, of length 4. And we calculated different distances between the final states of, of those sequences. Now, the problem is um, that we need to understand how we predict the future. And in this particular uh, case, the next element depends on the state of, of the last um, uh, measurement. Um, and so basically, that's why you see this uh, checkerboard structure. OK, um, so what are the... Uh, kind of takeaways uh, from, from this work. Uh, so we discussed um, our approach to um, measuring distances between um, uh, sequences. So we discussed the design for similarity measures um, and how to calculate the kernel for classification, basically leveraging the um, projected kernels. Of course, in the case where the main state will require multiple uh, kernel, uh, multiple qubits, uh, that would be um, an approximated solution. Um, then we talked about uh, s the fact that similarity of those states implies um, a future simula similarity of behaviors for those stochastic processes. Um, and that's kind of the heuristic that, that we use. Um, and I think uh, Vainu has uh, hinted towards our next uh, possible ste uh, steps, exploring uh, more complex um, uh, processes uh, and uh, different designs that uh, he presented. Yeah, thank you. We do have time for one question, if you want to take one. I uh, missed the part about Markovianity. So you have some models which are explicitly uh, Markovian yes. and then also generalized uh, models yes. that, that also include non-Markovian effects. Could you give an example of a financial uh, problem where the under... So uh, my, my guess would be most of the real world data has... Is this non-Markovian, a time series yes, data? Yes, it is not. Yes. So, but, but does the classical non-Markovianity, is it effectively simulated by quantum Markovian 
Yes, it is depending on the speed of the process. Uh, if the process stays a long time, and long can be relative notion, in the same state, we can assume that it forgets the past. Then we can use Markovian process. How we approach the thing. If the particular, Mark because Markovian model is much easier to handle in many ways. Uh, and it is clear, more clear uh, conceptually. You understand what is going on. Just imagine we model some price movement and we find that Markovian model doesn't work. Usually the first step will be with to increase the frequency of the modeling. For example, from one second to go to one tenth of the second, making clear that these 10 more uh, measurements in this one second will bring us to the Markovian property. Because at the 10 point, it will forget about the first point. But again, it is this is philosophical problem, you ask me. It is about the philosophy of the modeling, and it is difficult. Again, we solve this modeling and trying. Uh, it is not bad to use first order systems. First order means to make the system depending not only on the current state, but one state behind, for example. Uh, the other approach, based on the contemporary uh, uh, contemporary big languages model, they uh, uh, Markov Markov process is uh, automaton process, it's such a switching process. They use different idea uh, based on the uh, the way they encode the distance, the way they encode the embeddings. Uh, so it is more recursive approach. So maybe we will look in this, for example. Can our phantom circuit generate a language containing equal number opening and closing brackets? Now think about this. The number of opening brackets should match the number of closing. Somehow I have to count these things. How exactly this to happen using a quantum technology? In the classical case, we use the pushdown automat automaton. But in the quantum case, so again, very interesting. We were working on it. Next steps. Thank you so much for the question.